So this is a new chapter which is soil thermal regime. Radiation, convection and conduction responsible for the transfer of heat in the soil. Radiation, radiation uh, can come from direct and diffuse short wave solar radiation, long wave sky radiation to the soil surface, long wave radiation emitted outward from the soil surface. Radiation transfer is important only at or near at the soil surface. Convective is the movement of heat by a net fluid flux significantly only if the flow velocity is large, for example, rainfall, irrigation, seepage below streams, or if the fluid temperature differs significantly from the nearby soil. Convective heat transfer by vapor flux in soil is insignificant unless the vapor temperature is quite high, for example, uh, steam injection. Water vapor has on heat flux through absorption or release of heat energy during evaporation or condensation process in the soil. Conduction Conduction by molecular exchanges of kinetic energy is the mechanism most responsible for subsurface soil heat transfer. Now let's look at the uh, atmospheric energy balance. Extraterrestrial radiation so let's look at the Stephen Boltzmann law. So sun is the source for all radiant energy for the earth. Sun emits short wave electromagnetic radiation from its uh, surface high temperature. The surface has a temperature of about uh, 5700 Kelvin. So the energy flux summation uh, in a watt per meter square from a body at a temperature T in Kelvin is given by Stephen Boltzmann law. So the summation equals to epsilon multiplied by uh, sigma multiplied by temperature to the power 4 where uh, sigma is Stephen Boltzmann constant has a value of 5.67 multiplied by 10 to the power 8 uh, watt per meter square per Kelvin to the power 4 and epsilon is the emissivity equals to 1 for black body and has a value range from 0 to 1 for other radiant surfaces. Okay, now let us look at uh, example 5.1. So example 5.1, 5.1, calculate the radiant energy flux. Okay, radiant energy flux from the sun striking the outer edge of Earth atmosphere, assuming that sun radiates as a black body. So epsilon equals to uh, 1 and use the following data. Right, so distance from Earth to the Sun is an X. So we can draw an imaginary uh, diagram shows that this is the Sun has a radius R. So the Sun radius is R 6.97 times 10 to the power 8 meter. So the R is here, okay, the Sun, and then the Earth uh, somewhere far away from the Sun. So we can draw another radius uh, which has a distance X. So the x is referring to the distance from Earth to the Sun, x equals to 1.5 multiplied with 10 to the power uh, 11 meter. Okay, so we have x, we have r, r is radius of the Sun, x, x is the distance from the Earth surface towards the Sun center. Alright, so we can use the, the, what, the uh, uh, Stephen Boltzmann law, so we can rewrite the equation here. Uh, uh, which uh, this is a summation energy emitted by the sun at the core okay so if we know that the summation is actually uh, watt over meter square so we can write out q over a all right so the energy came up from the sun should be always the same because the sun emit we can we assume that the sun emit a constant amount of energy okay so we can use this equation so energy emit from the earth surface is q equals to uh, this epsilon multiplied by sigma multiplied by t to the power 4 and then of course the a now we move to the front and we have an a here where a is the surface area of the sun we assume that it's a nice sphere so the nice sphere has an area of 4 pi r squared so the r is the radius of the earth okay oh, sorry not, not the radius of the earth it's actually the radius of the it's the radius of the sun Okay, 
r is the radius of the sun all right okay so so we can now rewrite q equals to uh, epsilon multiplied by sigma multiplied by t to the power 4 multiplied by the a now the a is 4 pi r square okay so the r is the radius of the sun so we know that epsilon is 1 because it's, they say that it's a black body so 1 multiplied by the uh, the uh, uh, sigma 5.67 multiplied by 10 to the power negative 8 watt meter square over meter square over uh, kelvin to the power 4 so this value we, we already know this value uh, which is sigma uh, sigma is uh, given here okay 5.67 okay 10 to the power negative 8 so this is a Stephen Boltzmann constant okay so we put in the Stephen Boltzmann constant and then the temperature at the surface is given as 5760 Kelvin so 5760 Kelvin to the power 4 and then of course the area of the uh, the, the sun surf, uh, surface which is 4 pi uh, multiplied by the, radi by, by the radius of the sun 6.97 multiply with 10 to the power 8 meter so this is square right so we have a total energy here all right so now we want to find this energy emitted from the sun and how much does it when it hit the atmosphere of the earth so from the sun surface to the earth surface how much energy do we get so the easiest way we know that the constant energy is the same the amount of energy emit is the same um, but the area this time if the sun emit the energy from from the surface at the time it reached the earth's surface the energy has dissipated throughout the, all this area all right so we can again take q over a so but this time the a is 4 pi x square initially it was 4 pi r square for for the sun surface now it's at, it, it the energy has moved far away from the surface so we have x uh, square here so if, if everything on top is the same as before but just that now we have 4 pi uh, multiplied by x square so the x is 1.5 multiplied by 10 to the power 11 so 4 pi multiplied by 1.5 multiplied by 10 to the 10 to the power 11 meter and then we square it all right so that's how we get the um the radiant energy flux uh, uh from the sun striking the outer edge of an earth atmosphere so we get if we calculate all these we get one three four seven point six watt over meter square and uh, we know that one watt equals to 0 0.24 uh, calorie per second so we, we can convert this into calorie per centimeter square per meter square uh, sorry per, per minute per minute okay so we get 1.94 all right so this value either you put this value one three four seven point six or one point nine four calorie calorie per centimeter square per, per minute uh, this is called the solar constant okay so solar radiation uh, 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 excess component of solar radiation are important for uh, ecological field agriculture field soil science hydrology architecture design urban planning and uh, solar engineering all right all right interaction with atmosphere so the the radiation the solar radiation coming from the sun it is uh, in a form of uh, short wave so the short wave solar radiation reaches the outer edge of earth atmosphere dissipated before it strikes the soil surface okay so the energy coming from the, the sun all right so energy coming from the sun the short wave solar radiation uh, uh, some got uh, reflected 28 percent by cloud back into the space so we have around 28 uh, percent reflected so the extra terrestrial solar radiation coming in uh, about 28% got reflected by the cloud so a portion absorbed 16% by by uh, absorption okay absorption by water vapor oxygen ozone and carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere so 16% got absorbed okay a portion is scattered diffusely okay so 37% by molecule and particles in the air and then a portion uh, will strike earth surface all right so a portion is scatterly is, is scattered diffuse diffusely so 37 percent is coming from here so diffuse scattering so upward scattering 11 percent and downward scattering 26 percent so we add, we add these two together you get 37 percent so scattered diffusely 37 percent 
coming from downward scattering and uh, upward scattering. All right. Of course, this downward scattering is a portion that uh, will strike the Earth's surface. All right. A portion passing directly, so we have 19%. Okay. A portion passing directly, 19% through the atmosphere reaches Earth's surface. So 19% will reach the Earth's surface. All right. And then 26% uh, downward scattering will also will, will reach the Earth's surface. All right. So uh, this direct transmission, 19%. Okay. Direct passing directly, 90%. And downward scattering 26% from a scattered diffusely. Okay, so they combine to, to give 45%, which is known as global solar radiation. And uh, this global solar radiation uh, uh, is, a, is named as RS. Okay, uh, only 45% reaches the Earth's surface. Okay, so this diagram 5.2 is typical partitioning of the extraterrestrial radiation as it passes through the atmosphere. So if we have a uh, uh, this uh, global solar radiation coming in as a RS global solar radiation RS, okay. So how much uh, this global solar radiation is coming in actually uh, being absorbed by the, by the soil, okay? And uh, that's what we want to find. So we want to find how much uh, of this uh, global solar radiation absorbed in the soil in the forms of net radiation, okay? So this is called net radiation that absorbed by the soil. So a portion of of uh, global solar radiation RS is reflected at the surface and returned to space due to albedo. So it means this RS global solar radiation coming in, it got reflected back. So sixteen percent got reflected back in the forms of uh, albedo. So uh, it may not be a constant sixteen percent. It might change. Okay. So we have a uh, albedo a constant called A. Okay. So the thermal radiation from the sky. So uh, in the sky. So you know the sky absorbs the uh, uh, apart from diffuse the the radiation. It also it also absorbs the energy. So the sky will also warm up. So when the sky warm up, the sky will actually emit okay our sky okay radiation sky. So in the forms of long wave radi uh, long range uh, sorry long wave length range uh, strike the surface. So the our sky is a radiation coming from the sky. Because it become it heat up, so it releases the radiation in the forms of long wave length. It is strike strike the surface, so it, the the radiation from the sky will hit the surface as well. So we call it as R sky. All right. So a portion of R S, so the global solar radiation is lost by thermal radiation from the soil or canopy surface. So so when uh, it come in, it might get uh, uh, refracted. A portion of it might also got uh, uh, lost. Uh, in the forms of thermal radiation from the soil and canopy surface. So our earth, so the earth after absorbing the global solar radiation, it might emit it back to the uh, uh, to, to the to the space. So in they call it our earth. So the our earth is a net outgoing radiation. Okay. So seventeen percent about seventy percent. So our earth is a going out um, radiation from the from the earth surface. It's also in a long uh, long wavelength range. Okay. Alright, so we have a net radiation for well, Rn. So we want to find the Rn is a net uh, radiation uh, after the, 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 the global solar radiation coming in. Only a portion is actually obtained uh, by the soil. Okay, so that is called net radiation. So equals to uh, 1 minus albedo in the bracket. Okay, so multiply with the global solar radiation plus Rnt. Rnt is, uh, is, uh, is a net long wave thermal radiation which is given by r, r sky minus uh, r of radiation of so of this is both of them is uh, uh both of them are lo long range uh long sorry long wavelength uh radiation okay so r sky is the one that uh, the, the, the the radiation the radiation coming from the sky uh, in onto the earth so an R earth is the energy that uh, the radiation that emitted from the earth after absorbing the, the, the global solar radiation. So normally the uh, uh, R earth is greater than the R sky. All right. So this this value R n, uh, you call it uh, net radiation loss. Okay. So it's normally uh, this value is negative. Okay. So both R sky and R earth can be calculated with Stephen Boltzmann equation with appropriate value of uh, emissivity. All right. All right. So, uh, which is this case is epsilon. Okay, so so uh, this is how you you we calculate the net radiation. Okay, so we have a global solar radiation coming in. 
and then a portion will be absorbed by the soil, uh, which is called net radiation. All right. All right. So the net uh, thermal radiation loss, uh, RNT, so, so it's a net thermal radiation loss, so which is given by R sky, radiation sky, and radiation uh, minus radiation earth. So you normally, normally you get the value of negative. Okay, negative. So we can see that uh, here, this figure here, you can show you the uh, R earth is actually uh, greater than R sky. So on January, so the deficit is about 6%. So, so the R earth is slightly greater than R sky. So you take the R sky minus by the R earth, you get negative 6%. All right. And, uh, 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 and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in gen that's happened in January. Uh, but it's at high as uh, as high as fourteen percent in August. Okay, fourteen percent in August. So keep in mind that uh, this diagram is showing, uh, this graph shows to you the uh, the radiation balances throughout the year at Hamburg, Germany. So their case is different because they have four seasons. We don't have four seasons, so our cases our case might be slightly different than them. All right. So but this is a good example to to look at. Okay. So net thermal radiation is a dominant component in winter, uh, when solar radiation decreases. And causes our uh, causes this uh, uh what you call it uh, the net the net radiation causes the net net radiation uh, to become negative. So um, so you can see that uh, in winter time around January uh, from December to January we have around uh, negative uh, net radiation uh, uh, because uh, is uh, what we call that the net thermal radiation become dominant. Uh, this uh, global solar radiation reduces to almost none, okay, to almost uh, not significant compared to the uh, net thermal radiation loss, okay. So you get negative value uh, in uh, uh, when it comes to uh, radiation balances. Uh, I mean the net net uh, the net uh, radiation uh, radiation in uh, December and January, and also the uh, albedo varies from a high of about uh, zero point two in June, okay, zero point two in June. To almost zero in December. All right. So this is a, a situation for albedo as well. So albedo changes from month from month to month. All right. So let's look at example five point two, which uh, calculates the long wave thermal radiation energy flux R radiation of from from Earth, assuming that temperature on, on the Earth is three hundred Kelvin and the uh, emissivity of epsilon is zero zero point nine five. Estimate the wavelength at which the maximum energy Flux occur. So you use the uh, Stephen uh, Boltzmann equation. So R of equals to epsilon multiplied with the uh, uh, sorry the emissivity multiplied with sigma multiplied with temperature to the power four. So we know that the uh, the emissivity is zero point nine five. You put in zero point nine five, and the uh, sigma uh, is a constant. And then uh, you the, the, you can put in this value, and then the temperature is three hundred Kelvin. So you you find about uh, four hundred thirty six uh, watt per meter square. So uh, you take this value divided by the global global solar radiation. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, not global solar radiation. It's a, a solar constant. All right, we show it in the okay solar constant. Okay, so we divide with the solar constant, multiply by one hundred, we get about thirty two point four percent. So about thirty two point four percent that energy coming from the the sun is actually emitted back from the earth to the sky. All right, in the forms of R earth. All right. At a temperature of 300 Kelvin and emissivity, emissivity of 0.95. So now we want to find the we want to estimate the wavelength at which maximum energy flux occurs. So we can use this equation. You can call it uh, Wind Law. So it's a lambda m multiplied with t equals to a constant. So we just put in a 300 Kelvin here and then can uh, estimate the wavelength at which the maximum energy flux occurs, which is lambda n equals to 9.66 multiplied with 10 to the power negative 6 meter. All right. So here is the slide that shows the um, um the, the table so the ra the ratio of net radiation to global radiation uh, during twenty four hours period so uh, basically you could guess that uh, this uh, uh you know that just now we talk about uh, global solar radiations coming in from the sun all right so a, a portion of that will be absorbed by the soil and uh, that we call it uh, net radiation okay so red radiation arrive at the surface varies significantly with climate latitude and uh, surface cover all right so the global solar radiation decreases significantly during the winter month away from the equator so equator means uh, 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 catalyst, uh, this, uh, this, uh, our, like in the middle of the earth okay so it's called equator so that is a that, that is a the that is a greater seasonal variation in this ratio 
uh, in northern and southern latitude than the equator region. So we can look at uh, uh, cover effect. Of, there, there is also an effect of cover. There is also an effect of location. So if you are near to, if our location is near to the equator, all right. For example, Hawaii, all right. So we tend to have a, a higher ratio of uh, 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 net radiation that absorb uh, uh, by the, the the soil. So. So the the red radiation, uh, the net radiation over global solar radiation tend to be higher when you are near to the, uh, uh, near to the equator. For example, Malaysia is also near to the equator, so we should expect that uh, Rn, the net radiation over the uh, global solar radiation is higher. Right. So in this case, you see that Hawaii is a bit higher, uh, compared to other locations. So the other locations, for example, uh, the latitude of uh, thirty eight degrees to the south. 38 degrees to the north, 51 degrees to the north, 51, uh, 55 degrees to the north. So they have a lower uh, ratio of uh, net radiation over global solar radiation. In fact, not just that. In fact, if you look at the uh, the global solar radiation that arriving, it's also different, right? At uh, different locations, different. Uh, so it could be due to uh, 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 this uh, topography of the location, could be due to the location of the uh, 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 of the place, okay. So all these are uh, factors affecting the, uh, the 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 ratio of uh, net radiation uh, to the global radiation, okay. So all these affect the global solar radiation coming, uh, to that. Okay. Okay. So just in case uh, you have forgotten what is uh, uh latitude, what is uh longitude, okay. So here this is the uh this is the equator, all right. So the equator or in this this uh, graph you can you can see this equator. So Malaysia is very close to the equator. Alright, uh, so in fact Hawaii is also quite uh, near to the equator. Alright, and uh, we have another one is uh, prime uh, uh, meridian. Okay, prime meridian. So this is a prime meridian in a yellow line, vertical yellow line. This is a prime meridian. Um, so uh, let's talk about equator uh, lat latitude. So let's say we have a zero uh, degree uh, for latitude. So it's uh, on. It's actually on the equator. Let's say we have uh, 10, let's say in this dot, okay, in this dot we have uh, 14, 14 degree north and 30 west. So 14 degree uh, north is, is 10, 20, 30, 40, okay. So 40 degree north and 30 west, so 30 is towards the left, so 30, okay, 10, 20, 30, so we get tw uh, 30 degree west, okay. Uh, so this is location, so the point location, 30, 40 north. 30 west so this is how it's being read so this horizontal line is called latitude vertical line is called uh, longitude okay all right okay just a quick uh, recap on your geography so if you look at malaysia okay malaysia the uh, longitude is about 0 degree to 20 degrees Celsius. okay sorry 0 to 20 degree okay 0 to 20 degree uh, north um and uh, for the uh, uh, this is a, a long, long uh, latitude. Long for longitude is about hundred to hundred twenty. Okay, so it's about hundred to hundred twenty east. Okay, hundred to hundred twenty east. All right, all right. So th there are some uh, physical factors affecting solar radiation. So uh, for example, let's look at the uh, albedo. Albedo is a uh, refraction. So fractions or percentage of incoming solar radiation that is refracted. Okay. So means uh, uh, the solar radiation coming in and uh, the panto balik, okay, the panto balik refraction uh, refracted at the crop or soil surface is called albedo. So albedo is 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 about uh uh sinaran cahaya uh daripada matahari yang dipanto balik daripada uh daripada permukaan bumi. Okay. So this is called uh, albedo. Okay. So fraction or percentage of incoming incoming solar radiation that is refracted at the crop or soil surface is called albedo. Okay. So it depends. On the nature of the surface, sun sun angle, okay, and latitude, okay, albedo increases significantly with distance from equator, okay. So it means yeah, if far from the equator, uh, the higher the the the, the refraction, the higher the albedo, okay. So incoming solar radiation, uh, uh, incoming solar refraction from a low of seven percent near equator to a high of fifty six percent near North Pole, okay. So water surface about albedo is three to ten percent. Uh, it has a, a lower albedo than uh, crop or soil surfaces. Canopy surface we have about five to twenty five percent. So when you have canopy surface, 
your reflection is a bit higher. So high position of the sun in tropical climates, for example, in Malaysia, yeah, tropical climate, radiation strikes the surface of the earth normally, which causes less reflection than the sunlight arrive at the uh, at an angle. So uh, the topic tropical climates, uh, we have uh, less albedo uh, because the sun is very uh, hit hit on the surface directly. So direct heating, so less albedo. So hence albedo is higher in the morning because of low angle of the sun. Okay, so so this is uh, the, uh, the characteristic of. Uh, all right, so this uh, the, the, this is a uh, figure five point five and uh, table five point two. So you look at table five point two albedo at uh, of uh, various surfaces. So if you look at a dry soil, you have around fourteen to thirty percent of albedo. Uh, wet soil have a lower. Okay, wet soil you have a lower uh, albedo. So we can look at uh, canopy. So when you have a canopy, we have around five to twenty-five percent of uh, uh, albedo. Okay, and uh, if you look at this uh, Figo five point four, you look at the radiation and albedo distribution uh, in the northern hemisphere in relation to latitude. So latitude, for example, here you start from zero. So zero is near the equator, and then you, you go from uh, zero to ninety degrees north. So zero at equator go to 90 degree uh, to the north okay okay 90 degree in the north so we are looking at the northern hemisphere so here northern hemisphere the albedo start from very low when the sun uh, when uh, it's actually uh, near and it's actually at the equator very low very low when it hit the, the about 30 degrees it rise to a certain uh, height and then drop to about 60 degree no uh, northern uh, 60 degree north and then rise significantly to the to the the pole okay to the north pole uh, where you have a great amount of albedo because uh, the as shown in the previous slide, uh, albedo is higher in the morning because a uh, lower angle. So we have a very low angle at the at, at, at the at the what you call at the north pole. Okay, because the sun is actually hitting from the side. Okay, so that's why you have a very high albedo. And then the incoming short wave, uh, short short wave radiation. This is a, a global solar radiation. So the global solar radiation is quite high at the at the at the uh, equator. Because the sun uh, hit hit directly uh, to the Earth's surface to the equator, and then it rises to a certain degree, about uh, reach the peak around uh, twenty to thirty degree, uh, degree north, and then start to drop significantly as it moves far away. Because uh, the the what, what you call the uh, the thickness of the atmosphere. So the sun when it hits the equator, it hit uh, there is a shorter travel distance to uh, to the uh, soil surface. But when you hit the pool, also if, when it goes to the pool, hits the pool. It has a, a, a larger area of uh, a larger depth of uh, atmospheric layer. It has to pass through before it hit the soil of the of the pool. That's why the radiation drop as it goes all the way to the pool. Okay, so the the, the radiation actually reach the the pool is very very uh, uh, lower amount compared to those uh, at the uh, near the end. So uh, uh, when you compare the light color soil with the dark color soil, I say both are dry. One light color, one uh, uh, dark color. So uh, light color will have twice uh, reflection uh, than uh, the 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 dark color soil. Okay. So let's say uh, if the soil is uh, uh, dry, uh, we add water to the light uh, to the dry light soil, and then the surface of the soil turned uh, darker a bit. Uh, this one also decreases the solar reflection by up to fifty percent. So it means we darken the soil, the reflection become lesser. So, uh, so we de reduce the solar reflection by up to fifty percent. So let's say we apply a uh, white magnesium carbonate uh, to the surface of the bare soil, so it doubles its uh, albedo. Okay, so it means uh, the 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 reflections uh, actually increases by uh, uh, by uh, by uh, by turning the surface uh, into white by adding magnesium carbonate. Okay, and also rough soil surface has lower albedo than a smooth soil surface. So now let's uh, look at the effects of latitude. Okay, uh, angle at which sun rays uh, meet Earth uh, greatly influences the amount of radiation received per unit area for two reasons. Okay, first, uh, radiation approaching Earth at an angle uh, move through more of the uh, move through more of the atmosphere. Okay, so uh, imagine uh, uh, radiation uh, coming from the side. Okay. So sinaran cahaya matahari, uh, radiasi ni datang daripada matahari, tapi datang daripada di, bukan hentam terus ke atas tanah, tapi dia 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 hentam uh, daripada sisi. Ah, uh, disebabkan uh, sinaran cahaya tu datang daripada sisi tu, 
dia akan melalui uh, lapisan uh, atmosfera yang lebih tebal. Kalau dia hentam daripada atas, lapisan atmosfera dia lebih nipis. Okay, itu maksud dia. So, first, radiation approaching the Earth at an angle. So, daripada P, uh, move through more of the atmosphere and is subjected to greater scattering, refraction and absorption than radiation moving directly through the atmosphere. So, second, radiation striking Earth at an angle to vertical has a higher albedo uh, than radiation coming in normally. So, kalau sinar cahaya matahari yang sinar terus ke atas permukaan bumi daripada tepat-tepat daripada atas, sinar ke bawah, uh, albedo pun uh, rendah. Tapi daripada tepi, albedo dia lebih tinggi. So, sinar cahaya datang daripada angle daripada tepi, albedo dia tinggi. Uh, yang kedua, uh, dia punya uh, uh, scattering Refraction and absorption and, and, and absorption pun lebih tinggi. Okay, so global radiation decreases uh, rapidly at uh, latitude above 30 degrees Celsius. So you can see here global radiation decreases rapidly at latitude above 30 uh, degrees and reaches a constant at above 60. So above 60, it reaches a constant. So at uh, 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 radiation is quite high, I mean near to the near near to the equator, but if we near to the poles, uh, it become uh, quite low because it has to pass through a, a thicker uh, layer of atmosphere okay and uh, albedo lowers less than 10 percent okay lowers than 10 percent in the tropical region tropical, tropical region means latitude about zero degree north okay zero to 30 degrees north or maybe around 60 zero so when you're near to the equator it's very low so less than 10 percent okay of albedo sorry less than 10 percent of the uh, uh, every dose and uh, increases uh, slightly in the middle latitude middle latitude maybe around 30 to uh, around 30 degrees uh, 30 degree of north and rises sharply in the pool so when it goes to the pool 90 degree to the pool to the north uh, it uh, albedo uh, shot, uh, shoot up to the roof to, to the roof uh, very very right uh, rise very sharply okay so there's another uh, okay another factor physical factor affecting solar radiation so this is called exposure so in the north northern hemisphere okay northern hemisphere okay so means uh, a degree of uh, zero degree to 90 degree north okay so in the northern hemisphere the southern slope southern slope is a slope that uh, of the mountain that's facing the sun okay and there's also a, a, a north facing slope there are south facing slope and north facing slope south facing slope are facing the sun not facing so uh, uh, not not facing slope are not facing the sun okay so so in the northern hemisphere the southern slope okay this is a southern slope south facing slope receive more solar radiation per unit area uh, the temperature of the soil is always higher on the south than the north facing slope so the south facing uh, slope facing the sun it has a more higher temperature so southern exposure will always several degree warmer than the north facing slope okay so here have a several degree higher than the north facing slope greater temperature variation from night to day will observe on the south southern exposure so temperature variation is higher uh, temperature difference between exposure increase as the slope becomes steeper so the slope becomes steeper temperature difference be, uh, between exposure increases okay as the slope becomes steeper so exposure has very little influence on the surface heat balance in the tropics uh, because of the high elevation of the sun so this one is a uh, uh, this one is uh, the effect of sun uh, on on the south facing slope and north facing slope when it, and the sun is hitting on the for example the equator equator especially in the tropics area so that area uh, uh, exposure has a very little influence because the sun hit directly on the surface so also little influence on the polar climate because of the radiation strike surfaces uh, is similarly subjected to diffuse sky radiation without any slope mountain uh, hence radiation reaches uh, north and south slope at the same intensity so when in the polar climate means uh, north pole and south pole so the, the solar radiation uh, will have to pass through a thicker layer of atmosphere as a result uh, the, 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 the solar radiation goes through diffuse sky radiation because of that so uh, um, it has a very little uh, influence on the solar climate okay because it hit every, everywhere it's hit the uh, uh, north uh, the south facing south, uh, north facing slope with the same amount because it is due to diffuse sky radiation okay so that's that's why it doesn't have any influence on the polar climate as well as the uh, this is due to the what we call uh, diffuse sky radiation for the polar climate but for um, for this uh, equator the tropic area 
uh, because the sun heat directly uh, uh, um, hit direct uh, hit normally on the on on the surface. Okay, so exposure is of great interest. Uh, exposure is of greatest consequence consequence uh, in climates at uh, intermediate latitude. Okay, so exposure is of great is of greatest consequence in uh, climates of intermediate latitude. It means uh, uh, away from the away from the equator where slope is dominant apart from the apart from diffuse sky radiation okay so um that uh, there's also the effects of uh, distributions of uh, land and water okay so distribution of land and water will affect the temperature okay for example the island climates okay island uh, for example the island uh, uh, which means that uh, the the land area is surrounded by sea so island climates are less variable than continental climate so continental climate for example uh, 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 in uh, in uh, Europe, or in the uh, US, or in Africa, okay, continental climates, uh, due to the presence of uh, large bodies of uh, uh, water. Okay, to be more exact, the the island climate are less variable than continental climate due to the presence of large bodies of water tend to stabilize the temperature. Okay, so because of the high specific heat of water, which is responsible for the absorption of large amount of heat. So what does it mean is that because the island is actually surrounded by the water and the water has a large capacity as a has a, has a high uh, uh, specific heat of water okay specific heat of water means uh, uh, the water can absorb a lot of heat uh, which is responsible for the absorption of large, large amounts of heat so it means that the island surrounded by the by the water the water can absorb a lot of heat so it prevents the island from heat up too fast or cool down too fast as a result this uh, island climate uh, tends to be uh, 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 less variation means the climate tends to be more stabilized con compared to continental climate okay highly saturated water vapor in the atmosphere uh, which reduces the amount of radiant energy reaching the earth okay so this one also affected when the atmosphere has lots of water vapor the water vapor itself also absorbing a lot of uh, heat okay so this one prevent the heat from uh, prevent the radiant energy from uh, from hitting the earth okay so hence Continental climates can undergo greater seasonal ex seasonal extreme in the temperature. So for this reason, you might expect that there's uh, for continental climate means a large land area that's uh, far away from the sea. So these continental climates tends to be going through a more uh, uh, huge uh, variations of temperature. So this one they call it greater seasonal extreme, right? Uh, due to uh, uh, less amount of water, uh, also means that they are far away from the uh, uh, sea, something like that. So uh, vegetation also has uh, another uh, 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 property that uh, influences uh, the heat, uh, the heat uh, movement on the, the soil. Okay, so vegetation has an uh, insulating property of uh, plant cover, uh, hence uh, it affecting soil temperature. Alright, so vegetation, for example, plant things like that, they cover up the soil surface, so so the temperature can't reach the soil that easily. So for example, bare soil is unpro unprotected from direct ray, means direct uh, radiation. So it becomes very warm uh, during the uh, it becomes very warm during the hottest part of the day. So it means bare soil means soil without any vegetation cover. So they directly exposed to uh, radiation uh, from the sun. So it heat up okay during the day okay and and become very hot okay in cold season uh, exposed uh, soil losses its heat rapidly to the atmosphere. So uh, in Malaysia we don't have hot season uh, sorry we don't have cold season. So, but we only have at, at night. So at night, the soil losses its it, uh, heat uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, if if we without vegetation, the 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 heat is uh, losses to the atmosphere is even uh, uh, easier. When there is a vegetation, the losses of heat uh, is uh, slightly slower. Vegetation preventing heat loss at night and shield uh, surface during the day. Uh, it reduces daily soil temperature variation. So vegetation prevent heat loss. Okay, at night and shield surface during the day. So means at night, uh, uh, your loss of uh, heat is uh, slower because of vegetation. At the day, the, the heat up of the soil is also slower because of the shield of the vegetation. All right. So as a as a in overall, it reduces temperature variation of the soil. Okay. Similarly, frost penetration is more rapid and depth in bare soil than under a vegetative cover. Okay. So vegetative uh, very vegetative affects soil energy balance by altering albedo of the surface okay albedo albedo means reflection of the surface because of vegetation has a different uh, color okay 
uh, and uh, this has also a, a different amount of surface area to re reflect the light. Okay, decreasing depth of penetration of global radiation through the canopy. So the canopy uh, prevent the, the light from uh, hitting the ground directly, prevent the radiation from hitting the ground directly, and increasing the removal of uh, latent heat or by evaporation. So uh, you know, vegetation cover. Uh, they, they suck up the water from the soil and they remove the water from the stoma of the of of, of the of the leaf. Okay, uh, going through a process of uh, uh, evaporation and as well as transpiration. So this one increases the renewal of latent heat because the water when it vaporizes it, it carries the heat with it. Okay, and the last one decreasing the rate of uh, heat loss. Okay, decreasing the rate of heat loss from the soil by insulating the surface. So vegetation vegeta vegetation uh, can actually insulate the surface of the soil. As a result, it reduces the rate of uh, heat loss. Okay, mulches. Mulches uh, is something like a, a cover. So if you use uh, plastic as a cover, you use plant as a cover. So you mm -hmm. use, uh, for example, people use plastic to cover up the soil. So it so it, it is called mulches. Okay, mulches affect the thermal regime of the soil. Okay, so you use uh, light color plastic. Okay, light color plastic mulches transmit short wave radiation into the soil, but prevent uh, long wave from leaving the soil. Uh, hence, warm the soil underneath. Under, underneath. So what that means is that if you use a light plastic cover, so the the, the radiation from the sunlight, okay, the radiation from the sunlight, which is a short wave, it will get into it will get through the the the, the plastic and hit the ground, right? So but uh, when the when the ground admit so the radiation from the earth radiation earth R earth still remember R earth, the earth will emit radiation from the ground. Uh, the earth uh, emit the radiation is in terms of in, in the forms of long wave but the long wave will be trapped inside the soil because it cannot pass through the plastic mulches as a result uh, the, the, the soil covered by the plastic the, by the light color plastic uh, will prevent the heat from removed from the ground so the, 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 the heat uh, keep on entering into the light color plastic mulches but cannot leave uh, the, the, the plastic as a result the, the soil become uh, warm over time so, uh, so the uh, the soil uh, heat up uh, underneath. Okay, so low thermal conductivity mulches. So means if you use a plastic cover that has low thermal conductivity, uh, high thermal conductivity means uh, energy uh, heat can actually get through. Low thermal conductivity means uh, the energy uh, conduction cannot happen. So the the heat cannot remove uh, from the plastic cover as a result of low thermal conductivity. So this this low thermal conductivity mulches cover the soil cause. Uh, cooler soil in day, uh, cooler soil in day, but warmer soil uh, in night. Okay, so because it prevents the, the heat from removing at uh, night. So let's uh, move into soil surface energy balance. So uh, if you look at the energy balance equation, uh, you still remember. Uh, if you want to look at this, we must talk about this uh, global solar radiation. Okay, global solar radiations. Uh, we, we talk about RS. Okay, remember the RS, global solar radiation. And then that is the energy coming from the sun, but uh, the global solar radiation uh, coming from the sun only a portion that absorbed by the, the by, by by the by the soil. So that the, the amount of uh, of uh, energy that absorbed by the soil is called net radiation. You still remember that net radiation Rn. So the Rn arrive at the soil or the crop canopy surface. Okay. So uh, to, to 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 derive that equation, we must uh, uh, make two assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that number one, no lateral input of heat to the soil. So it means uh, uh, the global solar radiation coming in RS, and a portion of it will, will be absorbed by the by the uh, uh, by the soil, which is called net radiation RN. So that when the heat coming in, there's only RN, and and the heat RN, uh, there's no source coming in from the side. Okay, from the side of the uh, of the atmosphere, from the side, or from the soil side. Okay, no no lateral movement, only vertical. Okay, only only uh, vertical. Alright, so only uh, 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 top down or bottom up. Okay, so no lateral input of heat to the soil, only uh, vertical, uh, top down or bottom up. Okay, number two, neglect transient energy change. So means uh, the energy come in, coming energy is uh, almost constant. We assume that uh, there's no uh, sometimes small amount of energy, uh, high amount of energy, uh, uh, not yet constant, uh, keep on changing with, uh, uh, with, with time, not, not stable basically means, transient basically means not stable. So means the energy is coming in is stable. Okay. So hence our uh, one-dimensional steady state uh, heat energy balance at the surface. Okay, so we so we assume one-dimensional steady state heat energy balance at the surface. Uh, so we can construct the equation based on uh, the assumption that net heat energy arriving at the surface 
equal to net heat energy leaving the surface. So what's coming in is what's coming what is what going out. So that we can form a, a steady state energy uh, equation. Okay, so let us uh, look at the components of uh, energy um, balance. Okay, so there are uh, a few components. Uh, there are three. Okay, basically three. There are sensible, uh, sensible or convective heat flux. So you can call it sensible heat flux or convective heat flux. So given by S, uh, it has a unit of uh, 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 watt over meter square. All right. So it is a uh, uh, it is a vertical transport of warm air from the surface zone, okay, from the soil surface to upper atmosphere. Okay. So it is a vertical transport of warm air from the surface zone to the atmosphere above. So it is due to turbulence convection, but flow of air. Okay. Then the other one is a soil heat flux. Soil heat flux is J H. Okay. It's also in a watt per meter square. Um, so it's a vertical transport of heat into the soil. So the, the, when the, the soil receives the energy from the net radiation, so the, the heat will move down. So the, the, move, the downward movement of heat is called uh, soil heat flux. Okay? So we have soil heat flux, the energy that's moving in, and we have a, a convective, heat, convective, convective heat flux moving up uh, from the surface okay? due to uh, the bulk movement of air. Okay? And then you have the, the, the last one is a latent heat flux. Okay, latent heat flux H V uh, multiplied by uh, E T evapor transpiration has a unit of meter of uh, uh, watt over meter square. Okay, so uh, use of heat for evaporation with the subsequent transport of water vapor from uh, surface zone to the atmosphere. So E T has a unit of uh, evapor transpiration has a unit of kilogram over meter square per second is an evapor transpiration. So uh, the water vapor flux to the atmosphere by evaporation and plant transpiration. Okay, and the HV is a latent heat of vaporization. Okay, this is uh, somehow like constant, but it change with temperature. So vapor transport away from the surface predominantly by convection it means the movement of water vapor. Okay, so 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 you have a, a convective heat flux as okay, uh, move up due to the bulk movement due to the bulk movement of air, and uh, you have a latent heat flux. Uh, due to the water move, uh, water, uh, water vapor movement from the surface zone to the atmosphere. Okay, latent heat flux, and then you also have the soil heat flux, uh, soil heat flux that uh, the the heat movement into the soil. Okay, so once you uh, so we can write a steady state uh, heat equation, uh, which is the net radiation equals to net radiation equals to the S the set the convective heat flux plus the latent heat flux, and then the soil heat flux. Okay, all right. So the term on the on the right side are positive. So all these are positive when they move away from the surface. So when they receive the energy from net radiation, and then the heat, uh, you see the net heat energy arriving at the surface equals the net heat energy leaving the surface. So they receive the, the energy from the uh, from the net radiation, and then the heat will move away. Uh, while one of it is JH is a soil heat flux. They move into the soil. The other two is a uh, uh, we have one is a uh, convective heat flux due to the uh, due, due to the um, co uh, turbulent convection of the air it move upward okay so the air from here move up okay warm air on, on the surface move up carry the energy with it so that is called the uh, uh, convective heat flux and also when the when the surface has water the water vaporized become water vapor and also plant absorb the water and, and, and evaporate the water and that is, that is uh, both evaporation and uh, and uh, transpiration both combine to give latent heat flux okay latent heat flux so they all move away and we only have one incoming and three moving away from the surface okay this slide shows the uh, figure 5.6 components of surface energy balance so you can see that we have a net radiation uh, in this case uh, we have a it's a daytime and nighttime uh, net radiation in the daytime is positive net radiation at nighttime is negative okay so net radiation uh, nighttime is negative means the energy is leaving from the surface so positive means incoming, receiving. Okay, all right. So uh, evaporation stays the same daytime or nighttime, but uh, in for soil heat, uh, it is leaving. Uh, for nighttime, it is going towards the surface, and the sensible heat is leaving the surface at daytime, while at nighttime it is moving towards the surface. Okay, so these kind of differences uh, between the daytime and nighttime happened. Okay. Uh, means that uh, indicates the directions of uh, the sign basically we, we uh, refer to the directions of energy okay moving on the reason we have a water vapor flux because liquid water require energy to evaporate into what into vapor hence vapor carries away portions of energy that arrive at the surface so 
um, that's why we have a latent heat flux uh, included into the equation because uh, as the water it vaporizes into vapor, it carries lots of energy away uh, from the soil. Okay, so you look at table five point three. You see, uh, during the uh, dry bare soil and the water uh, full cover crop. So if this is a different condition. One is dry soil, one is uh, wet soil. Okay, so you can we try to compare uh, the uh, incoming energy uh, that has a component of uh, uh, convective heat flux okay convective okay is it correct convective okay convective heat flux uh, s okay and then we have a latent heat flux as well as a soil heat flux okay so uh, for dry soil so because it has no water uh, the latent heat flux is uh, almost zero okay but then if you look at uh, uh, the soil heat flux is about 55 percent and uh, and uh, uh, 55 percent of the the net radiation of, of the incoming energy from the sun. Uh, if you look at uh, this uh, convective heat flux, only about zero, about forty five percent. All right. So and we compare it to the uh, so if you, if you combine these two, you uh, zero point four five add with zero point five five, you get hundred percent. Okay, hundred percent. So here is the water full cover crop also hundred percent, but uh, in, when it's wet, it's a full cover water water full cover crop. So it means uh, no space for uh, for air, okay, uh, or maybe very little, very little space for air. Uh, when there's a lot of water, you see that uh, latent heat flux contribute about seventy percent, okay, seventy percent of the net radiation, okay, seventy percent of the net radiation means when there's a lot of water, the energy that lost from the soil uh, is actually about seventy percent due to uh, latent heat flux due to uh, evapotranspiration. All right, so that's why uh, water, water, uh, water vapor flux is very important. When it comes to the surface of the soil, uh, when it comes to how the the energy is being lost at the surface of the soil. Okay, this slide uh, shows the diurnal pattern of energy balance uh, uh, terms of terms for no-till corn field in uh, central Iowa. All right, so you can see the net radiation, uh, net radiation coming in Rn. Okay, and then you have this uh, uh, this uh, 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 convective heat convective heat flux due to buff movement of uh, buff. Bulb, uh, movement of air and then you have a latent heat flux okay latent heat flux due to uh, uh, vapor va uh, vapor flux vapor water vapor flow and then you have a soil uh, soil heat flux okay soil heat flux uh, at the bottom so the soil heat flux is not very significant uh, most of the time but in this case you can see that the uh, the, the, the bulb air movement uh, the what you call that convective heat convective heat flux is quite significant uh, uh, at uh, different uh, uh, in this case, about two two days or in, in these two days of the year, all right. So basically, if you add up these uh, uh, soil heat flux, uh, convective heat flux, and latent uh, latent heat flux, uh, you you should get uh, the the incoming uh, radiation, okay, in incoming uh, net radiation. So different time of the day, you have a different distribution of energy when the heat and when the net radiation is coming in. So so that's the changes of. Uh, 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 soil, soil heat flux, latent heat flux, as well as uh, uh, convective uh, heat flux. Okay, so if you look at this this uh, figure again, you can see that uh, uh, certain time we, we have a peak, so you can see that it's most probably the the noon time or the day time, and then you have flat, uh, most probably is in the uh, night time. So in the night time, uh, you, in this case, you can see that. Uh, this uh, latent heat of evaporation is quite significant at night. Okay, so you see latent heat of uh, latent heat of evaporation is quite significant at night, uh, and uh, and the soil heat flux uh, in this case uh, what you call that uh, uh, net solar radiation is very low, uh, uh, followed by this uh, 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 convective heat flux as well as the uh, uh, soil heat flux very low. But the highest one at night is uh, dominant by the latent heat flux. Okay. Okay. Now let us talk about heat flow in the soil, in JH. Okay. So soil heat flux, or an other name called uh, heat flux density, is the amount of thermal energy that move uh, through an area of soil in a unit of time. All right. So the magnitude is affected by surface cover, uh, soil moisture content, and uh, solar ir ir irradiance means uh, uh, means uh, the 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 uh, this uh, energy from the sun. Okay. Or, or this uh, uh, net radiation, all right. So uh, JH or solar solar heat flux in daytime peak hourly for bare, I mean uh, empty soil, uh, no 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 canopy, 
uh, dry uh, uh, dry soil midsummer that can be over 300 or what per meter square so the soil heat flux for moist soil beneath a plant canopy so means have uh, a plant cover at the top of the soil or even a snow cover uh, will often be uh, less than plus minus 20 watt per meter square so most of soil heat flux measurement is carried out using one of the four methods for example you can use a uh, flux plate calorie metric uh, gradient or a combination of, of all these methods all right okay the soil heat flux equation all right so heat flux uh, heat energy transport uh, through the soil by a few mechanisms so there are conduction radiation convection of heat by flowing liquid water convection of heat by moving air or vapor and uh, convection of latent heat so conduction is basically the movement due to uh, molecular um, vibration radiation is due to the uh, this uh, uh, the light and the convection heat is uh, uh, means it's basically the movement uh, movement uh, movement uh, for example in this case is a uh, liquid water and, uh, and uh, convection can also happen to the air and as well as a uh, vapor so convention convection of latent heat basically means uh, the evaporations of uh, 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 water become uh, uh, become vapor and then it carries the heat with it so that's called convection of latent heat so among these mechanism conduction the one in red conduction and convection of latent heat so this is the convection of latent heat are two most important okay most important basically mean they are most significant effect okay so conduction refers to transport heat transport by molecular collision uh, so basically the molecular activity molecular vibration okay collisions so uh, for pure solid substance conductive heat heat flux so uh, uh, soil heat flux they call it conductive heat flux jhc is actually given by uh, the lambda which is the uh, dry soil thermal conductivity and multiply with the spatial derivative on the temperature all right so t is the temperature okay so convection of uh, latent heat refers to the transport transport of latent heat energy so it's the energy per mass required for vaporization in uh, water vapor so the water vapor is transported by air movement after it was vaporized at point a so at uh, okay here at point a so it's a uh, vaporized okay after it's vaporized, it's being transported. Okay, so it absorb or addition heat to vaporize. So the the heat, okay, at the bottom you provide the heat. So the uh, the water absorb the heat and then it vaporize. So at point B, it condense uh, on heating a cold wall, causing it causing the liberation of heat. So after it vaporize, it absorb energy, it vaporize, and then it is transported vapor flow and then it heat okay heat on point b so the heat out so the to condense it has to release the heat and then condense to form the liquid okay so during the condensation the heat was being released and then it falls down uh, into the cup below so at point b it condenses it, it condenses on heating a cold wall causing the liberations of heat so the net result is the lateral transport of heat from point a point a to point b okay traveling uh, in latent form as vapor move so the latent heat latent heat convection expression okay the latent heat of uh, latent heat of uh, lit, uh, the 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 what the what you call the uh, the convection of latent heat expression is given by uh, jhv equals to hv which is the latent heat of vaporization multiplied by jv uh, jv which is the water vapor uh, uh, water vapor mass flux so now if we look at the, the the net soil heat flux just now we talk about the uh, convection of latent heat we also talk about this uh, pure solid substance uh, conductive heat uh, flux so we have uh, uh, conduction as well as uh, convection of latent heat so with these two combined uh, we have uh, jhc which is uh, uh, the conduction okay uh, this one okay uh, the conduction of uh, heat flux okay and then we have uh, J jhp is a uh, uh, latent heat flux okay Convec uh, convections of latent heat okay so these two combine uh, we will have uh, this this forms of equation where the lambda uh, asterisk is the moist is the moist porous thermal conductivity of the medium so in addition the impositions of temperature gradient 
on the moist soil sample will cause movement okay movement of uh, liquid water and water vapor apart from heat movement so this lambda not just include the solid material it also include the liquid inside the solid material because soil is not dry uh, the soil also has a um, uh, liquid material as well as a uh, vapor right because of the air space so so it will cause when we impose temperature gradient cause the movement of a uh, liquid water as well as a uh, water vapor okay so apart from the thermal conduction so thus changing uh, lambda asterisk at different water content as the as the way to compensate for convections of uh, liquid water and uh, water vapor okay so water vapor flux under temperature gradient is given by this uh, dtw which is called the thermal vapor diffusivity and then multiply with the, the temperature uh, the derivative on the temperature uh, the spatial derivative on the temperature right this equation is accurate except when it's a very dry soil uh, where relative humidity drops significantly below unity okay so at equation two so this is uh, the water vapor flux equation into equation one so equation two into equation one so equation two into equation one so we will get something like this and then we can we, we can take uh, we can remove the temperature uh, the, the spatial derivative on the temperature so we, we can have this in the bracket so we have some conduction okay conduction as well as convection of latent heat okay so we can simplify it and call it the effective uh, thermal conductivity okay effective thermal conductivity all right so effective thermal conductivity is a mesh uh, is uh, measurable by any method that measure uh, this uh, thermal conductivity in a solid okay so now let's look at the, the heat conservation equation so heat conservation equation is talking about uh, how much is getting in how much is leaving if the entering is more than leaving so we have a uh, accumulation so if the leaving is more than uh, entering we have a uh, depreciation so conservation is basically means uh, is monitoring the, the the storage whether the storage is uh, become bigger or the storage uh, deplete over time so in this case talk about heat conservation equation so we talk about whether the energy stored within a, a volume is increasing or decreasing uh, with time all right so we have a storage of energy h h is heat storage which changes with time and then of course uh, the, the entering and leaving of uh, heat uh, through the volume so the heat enter the volume whether it's addition and then uh, uh, addition and subtraction uh, and uh, means uh, input and output okay from from the uh, from the volume all right and then uh, whether there's a creation or depletion okay uh, in, in the in the volume all right so this equation assumes that heat is flowing in the vertical z direction that's why you have a, a uh, uh, dealt, uh, the, the, the dz here because it's vertical directions uh, heat conservation equation so we have this form so h is heat, heat storage or concentration heat energy per volume all right so r is uh, heat addition when when it's a uh, positive rh and becomes sink when it becomes negative rh so this is a heat addition or heat sink per volume all right so heat content per volume h is equals to the the C soil. C soil is a soil volumetric heat capacity. All right. So they multiply with the uh, temperature uh, uh, minus with the uh, temp uh, reference temperature. So the T T T reference is in Kelvin. It's an arbitrary reference temperature at which H equals to zero. All right. So placing equation five three four. So this is equation five three four for heat content uh, heat storage. Uh, and 529 529 is a so, uh, soil, uh, soil heat flux okay soil uh, uh, heat flux uh, equation that we derive for this okay 529 so 534 this one and 529 uh, the previous slide they put into 533 all right so this is 533 equation uh, heat conservation equation so we will get something like this okay left side like this and the right side kind of like this so uh, the derivative of the recovery if we expand this we get this and this all right so if if we take derivative of t uh, uh, d uh, t reference we will get zero so this this part becomes zero so we only left with uh, c soil uh, the, the time derivative on the temperature and then of course uh, this uh, uh, effective 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 thermal conductivity uh, does not change especially with within the cell within the unit volume so we can take it out and then we have something like this 
and then if we take the effective thermal conductivity divided by the soil volumetric heat capacity now we, we, we will get the KT KT is the apparent soil thermal conductivity including the effect of conduction as well as convection of latent heat so this equation 536 is known as heat flow equation so when we talk about heat flow equation we are talking about this equation so when we talk about soil heat flux uh, we're talking about the flux through a surface uh, it can be an input can be an output uh, but when we talk about heat flow equation we talk about the, the changes of uh, uh, heat storage within a volume that is whether in uh, addition or in uh, depreciation okay so this is a conservation of heat equation okay so now let's look at the thermal property of soil so heat capacity okay so just now we will show you about this uh, heat storage heat storage has a uh, C soil C soil is a soil volumetric heat capacity so now we're trying to look at what is soil volumetric heat capacity so soil volumetric heat capacity so heat capacity is a mixture of material in soil the volumetric heat capacity is the sum of heat capacity of the constituent uh, weighted by their volume fraction so C soil uh, volumetric heat capacity equals to uh, theta A so this is theta is you know, volume phase uh, volume phase content so it's a volumetric air content uh, theta A this is volumetric water content and this is volumetric of uh, solid substance okay and then CA CA is a volumetric air content so uh, C in general is a volumetric heat so it's a volumetric heat capacity okay so it's a volumetric heat capacity so you can see uh, when you have when you have the word volumetric you can see the unit meter uh, cube so it's a joule per meter cube per kelvin so uh, so you have a unit of a meter cube Right, because it's referring to volumetric all right so this is a uh, volumetric heat capacity for air this is a volumetric heat capacity for water and this is a volumetric heat capacity for the substance uh, uh, s okay all right so the volumetric heat capacity of air and water for air uh, ca this ca is can be given by rho a rho a is the density of air multiplied with ca the small ca so CA is actually the specific heat capacity okay so when you have the word specific specific what does it mean specific means it's a per kg all right per kg okay a per kg so you have a, a, a kg so but if you take this the density of air multiply with the specific heat capacity of air you will change the kilogram because uh, kilogram into uh, meter cube because this uh, rho density of air is kilogram over meter cube so you can uh, uh, cancel out the kilogram and then replace it with the meter cube when you multiply with the density of air so so that's why the ca is equals to rho a multiplied by ca similarly for the uh, uh, heat uh, volumetric heat capacity uh, for water uh, you, you, you is equals to the density of water multiplied with the specific heat capacity of water right so we can cancel out the kilogram and then change it with the uh, 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 volume okay a meter cube all right by just multiplying with the density of water so soil mineral differ little in their heat capacity value okay so here you see the summation of uh, uh, summations of volumetric heat capacity so the summation of volumetric heat capacity here uh, we already account for air we account for water but there is also other solid for example the mineral uh, it can be clay silk uh, uh, sand uh, clay silk sand and also include uh, other substances like for example uh, organic material okay so solid soil mineral differ little in their heat capacity value but organic matter specific heat capacity oh sorry specific heat okay specific heat capacity is higher than that of soil minerals okay so the in 1963 recommended average value of 0 0.43 calorie per centimeter cube per kelvin for mineral okay for mineral soil 0.64 organic material volumetric heat capacity okay so and 1.0 1.0 for water so the heat capacity for air uh, is uh, smaller and may be neglected okay so uh, air is much smaller so water you have 1.0 uh, mineral you have 0.46 and for organic material you got 0.6 uh, volumetric heat capacity all right, so this slide uh, uh, shows you the simplification of the uh, 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 soil volumetric heat capacity. All right, so soil volumetric uh, heat capacity, C soil, equals to the volumetric water content 
and it multiply with one. Just now we show you that the heat capacity of um, sorry the heat capacity of for water is one point zero. So we can put here one. All right. So here is a volumetric uh uh volumetric uh, uh mineral content. Okay. Uh, volumetric mineral content multiply with the uh, uh heat capacity uh heat uh, volumetric heat capacity of mineral and then plus with the uh these are organic uh volumetric volumetric uh, uh organic content and then the heat capacity uh the heat the heat capacity the volumetric heat capacity of organic okay so uh and then of course you can simplify this into just volumetric water content and then uh, the the volumetric uh, heat capacity of for mineral is uh, 0 0.46 the sum we talk about 0 0.46 for mineral, 0 0.6 for organic metals, so 0 0.46 and 0 0.6, and then we have this equation, and then uh, we also know that uh, one is equals to volumetric water content, volumetric air content, volumetric mineral, and uh, uh, volumetric organic. Okay, so we know that volumetric water and volumetric air is actually the porosity, so the porosity uh, uh, become the fee. Okay, so we have a phi here. So then you can rewrite this equation into one equals to phi plus uh, volumetric, uh, water con uh, volumetric mineral content and volumetric organic content. Okay, so now you can rearrange for mi uh, volumetric mineral content equals to one minus phi minus organic uh, volumetric water content. All right, so if we can change uh, uh, this equation, all right, into this this form. So this uh, the volumetric water content. Okay, the volumetric aspect, the volumetric mineral content. We can take this equation, put it here. So you will get uh, uh, these forms of equation. So soil heat capacity can be measured directly by using uh, calorimetry, and uh, then this table, table five point five, show you different uh, specific heat. Specific heat heat basically means uh, uh, calorie per per gram, per, per gram or per kilogram. So in this case, it's per gram. So you know that it's called specific because it's per uh, mass. So, so it's a specific heat. So you want to change it to meter cube. Uh, all you need to do is to multiply with the density of uh, this individual substance, and then you will get uh, per, meet, uh, per per centimeter cube or per per uh, meter cube. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, uh soil thermal conductivity. So soil thermal conductivity is something like this. Okay. So this is uh, effective thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity. Uh, you have uh, uh here we have a thermal conductivity. All right, so thermal conductivity here we have uh, 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 three possibly have three things. First, uh, thermal conductivity that due to the uh, the heat the heat movement itself uh, due to what you call that um, um, what does it call um, it calls the um, the molecular collision. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it call, it's called the molecular collision. Yeah, heat transport by molecular collision. So the conduction itself, okay, and uh, the other two is uh, for example the um, the the movement of liquid water and the movement of water vapor. So that one also can contribute to the uh, thermal conductivity, okay. So if we talk at the uh, if we talk on, on the solid side itself, just without the water, without the vapor, just the solid uh, arrangement of the solid material. Uh, I mean the soil itself, particles, different particles, for example, quartz, feldspar, water, and uh, uh, air in a separation. So in separation, they have a different uh, uh, thermal conductivity, right? So here in this case, quartz is like it's like uh, very close to sand. You can you can say that it's like a sand. You have around twenty point four, okay, milli ca uh, calorie uh, per centimeter per degree Celsius uh, per per second. You can also convert it into a uh, Watt per meter per per Kelvin, we have around eight point five. Okay, so you can look at this. Uh, it's different. The highest one goes to quartz, and uh, the lowest one goes to the air. All right. The ratio of thermal conductivity for quartz, water, and air. So if if we put that uh, into the ratio, we get three 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 for quartz. Uh, water you got twenty three, and uh, air as one. So so uh, water is twenty three times greater than air. And quartz is 333 times greater than air. Alright, because of the significant large values of solid for solid, granular soil thermal conductivity depends on contact um contact intimacy of the particles. Okay, so whether the particle is uh, 
in contact or not. Okay, and the extent of the air displacement by water in the pores in the pore spaces between particles. Okay, so relative uh, thermal conductivity for different soils. So, if, for example, sand is greater than loam, loam is greater than clay, clay is greater than peat. So, in terms of thermal conductivity, sand is the highest, the lowest is a peat. Okay, so thermal conductivity of mineral are same orders of magnitude, uh, hence. Uh, at the same dryness, it is affected by packing and porosity. So if you have a good packing, uh, you have a greater thermal conductivity. If uh, the packing is not so good, uh, you, you, you have a lower thermal conductivity. So reducing particle size reduces thermal conductivity due to poor surface contact between adjacent particles. So the, the bigger the size, the better the thermal conductivity. Increasing soil bulk density uh, lower porosity Okay, increasing the, the soil bulk density, lower porosity, improve the thermal, con uh, thermal contact and, the, and reducing volume of low conducting air. So increasing the bulk density, you increase the uh, thermal conductivity. Okay, okay this uh, uh, slide shows uh, figure 5.10 uh, and 5.11. So figure 5.10, 5.11 shows decreasing porosity. So if you read the Decreasing the porosity increase thermal conductivity. So what happens is that if you increase the bulk density, okay, so you increase the bulk density, uh, you decrease the porosity. So hence increase thermal conductivity. So is it clear? Uh, it is uh, quite clear here. So at uh, almost same uh, equal water saturation. So if you increase the bulk density, okay, so like uh, this uh, triangle, open triangle, you, it has a higher bulk density compared with the 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 the, the field circle. So when uh, at a uh, higher bulk density, yeah, you get a uh, uh, higher thermal conductivity. So higher bulk density uh, also decrease the porosity. So that's why uh, decreases the porosity, you increase the thermal conductivity. And secondly, increasing water content increase uh, creates water foam that improve contact between soil particles. So we see the water content increase, the thermal conductivity increase. So so uh, increasing water content uh, increase thermal conductivity. Because it replaces the air by water, the water has 20 times greater uh, thermal conductivity. So we can see that air is 1, and for water, uh, it's 23 times greater than air in terms of thermal conductivity. So when you add more water into the soil, you increase the, the soil thermal conductivity. All right? The greater rate of increase in uh, conductivity uh, uh, occurs at lower uh, moisture content. So at low uh, moisture content, from 0 to 0 0.6, 0 to 0 0.6, uh, you can see that uh, the thermal conductivity increase at a greater rate and then slowly leveling off, okay, slowly leveling off. So at the uh, lower moisture content, the increasing uh, water content increase the thermal conductivity rate uh, uh, greater, okay. So this uh, slide shows that thermal conductivity is caused by pure conductions and convections of latent heat. Okay, so just pure connections, uh, pure connections and convection of heat. So, um, so figure uh, 5.1, 5.12 is a thermal conductivity versus volumetric air content at four medium texture. So we can see that the increase in air porosity increases convections uh, of latent heat. Basically means as an air space increase in the soil, so you have more space for uh, convections of latent heat. So water become vapor and then transported in the forms of convection by uh, uh, latent, heat, latent heat flux but overwhelmed by the sharp decrease in the uh, pure conductions so so that's why we, when the volumetric air content increase uh, the thermal conductivity drop even though you have an increase of uh, convections of latent heat all right now let's look at the applications applications of the heat flow equation the steady state heat flow problem so here example 5.4 so this example shows uh, there's a soil column contain 50 cm of dry quartz sand. So we have a dry quartz sand, 50 cm, uh, the lambda S is a 0 0.5, over 25 cm of dry loam. So at the bottom we have 25 cm, at the bottom is a, the lambda is a, the thermal conductivity is 0 0.25. The top of the column is held at, at uh, temperature 30 degrees Celsius, the bottom is T equals to 5 degrees Celsius. So calculate the steady state heat flux through the two layer and the temperature at the sand loam sand loam interface. So we want to find the T middle. So our orientation is zero. Uh, sorry, our orientation is uh, 
towards bottom so zero at the top uh, plus z at the bottom okay so um so we want to do that uh, we, we we know that the heat flux through the uh, through the sand is the same as a heat flux through the dry loam right so the heat flux uh, flux the top layer must be the same as through the bottom layer so the j the soil heat flux top which is referring to the uh, sand equals to the uh, soil heat flux through the dry loam so here uh, is negative lambda top which is referring to the sand uh, 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 multiply with the j uh, j uh, sorry multiply with the t top which is 30 degrees Celsius minus the t middle okay divided by the uh, z top minus to minus the z middle okay equals to minus uh, lambda bottom okay lambda bottom which is lambda l uh, multiply with the t middle okay t middle minus the t bottom which is 5 degrees Celsius and then the z middle z middle here minus with the z okay z bottom all right so what we have here is uh, we can put in the value so minus 0 0.5 uh, lambda top is, is 0 0.5 okay and then uh, the t top okay is 30 degrees Celsius t minor we don't know z top uh, is 0 okay z top is 0 uh, 0 minus 0 minus uh, 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 z middle is uh, 50 centimeter okay so we have a negative 50 equals to negative 0 0.25 which is uh, lam uh, lambda L the thermal conductivity of the loam uh, is 0 0.25 the t middle we don't know uh, minus 5 degrees Celsius divided by z middle uh, which is uh, 50 minus with uh, bottom is uh, neg uh, bottom is 75 so 50 minus 75 uh, you get negative 25 all right so we can find the t middle which is 17.5 degrees Celsius all right so we know the t middle is 17.5 degrees Celsius now calculate the steady state flux through the two layers so if we know the heat flux through one layer we can know the heat flux through another layer all right because they should be the same all right so the flux through the top layer is the same as the flux through the two layers so we just take the flux to the top which is a flux to the uh, dry quartz sand uh, equals to negative 0 0.5 uh, 30 degrees Celsius at the top middle is 17.5 and uh, divided by the space which is negative 50 centimeter then we get 0 0.125 milli calorie per centimeter square Per Celsius okay okay now let us look at the uh, annual temperature changes changes in the soil so since temperature in the soil is rarely in steady state so means temperature in the soil is changing so example the constant temperature is not possible okay because so temperature is always changing all right so solving equation 536 okay, equation 536 we already described in the previous slide before so it's a soil uh, it's a soil conservation uh, equation if we look back to the previous slide Okay. okay this is heat flow equation so it's a heat conservation equation heat flow equation okay all right so time dependent time dependent equation for temperature variation in the soil uh, we can use this equation so temperature changes with time so we have an uh, uh, we have uh, this uh, annual average da is an uh, annual average temperature da plus the a a is the amplitude of the surface fluctuation so for example you have a temperature change uh, uh, so uh, then you have the amplitude okay how high that is amplitude so that's a all right and uh, phi is a phase constant so for example look at the graph below so we, we have a uh, uh, we have the one that without phi uh, plus phi and uh, minus phi so you can see how this uh, uh, transition of the sine okay sign sign uh, graph uh, change, change okay so phi is a phase constant and w is the 2 pi over tau uh, is the angular frequency so tau is the uh, the period time needed to get a complete cycle so let's say you, you, you the complete cycle is one year so your your tau time is a uh, is is one year all right okay so equation 5.46 equation 5.46 can be used as a top boundary temperature so you can use this to to, to guide it to uh, estimate the changes of temperature 
at the uh, uh, top boundary. Okay, at the bottom boundary, it is reasonable to assume will stay at the uh, average temperature. So the bottom boundary, we assume that at, at z uh, uh, near to negative infinity, so it means very deep soil, we can assume that the temperature stay more or less the same as a Ta. Okay, so Ta is an annual average temperature. Right, so you will equal out average out you get annual temperature or you go deep enough you also will find the constant temperature at the uh, very deep soil so if we find the analytical solution okay so we try to solve the equation that combine equation 4.5.36 5.46 and 5.47 so we combine these these and these and try to find a solution now uh, we'll get equation 5.48 so this is an equation that uh, will help you to predict at different depths at, at different time and you can know the temperature so the temperature has a z as a depth into the soil a uh, still referring to the amplitude and then uh, 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 amplitude at, at the surface so ta is the average temperature and then this whole thing uh, a multiplied by the, the, the exponential of z over d d is a damping D is a uh, we call damp, uh, damping depth. Okay, D is a damping depth. Um, and this this whole thing give you the amplitude and the sign. Uh, uh, in the bracket, W T plus V plus Z over D. Uh, this one uh, will give you the, uh, will help you to predict the changes uh, with depths and time into the soil. So the damping time, the damping depth, D equals to uh, 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 the uh, the uh, the square root of 2 multiplied with kt you know what's kt kt is the the what uh, the uh, what we call that apparent soil thermal diffusivity okay so kt is the apparent soil thermal diffusivity okay okay so kt is a uh, apparent soil thermal diffusivity divided by the uh, w which is the angular frequency right so we can simplify this equation further to get this form Right, so that's a damping depth. Okay, so now let's look at uh, uh, the following slide. The following slide is about uh, um, uh, you can see there's a equation five uh, five point four eight equation five point four eight. Okay, this is the equation five point four eight. Uh, it's a sine wave amplitude decreases uh, with uh, depth. Okay, so you can see that uh, you can see uh, here is a different depth. Okay, so here zero is uh, at the surface. Uh, this this graph is to show you the soil temperature variation uh, with time. Okay, so with time, um, um, so it go through the, the time of uh, here is a year. So it go through the time of two years. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, at 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 zero depth at negative hundred at uh, negative two hundred and. Uh, uh, at the depth of near infinity so see at the at near surface at, at surface the amplitude changes is quite uh, large uh, when you go through negative 200 200 uh, depth uh, you see that the, the fluctuation uh, the fluctuation of the amplitude becomes smaller and if you go to negative 200 the fluctuation amplitude is even smaller and we go to infinity is a almost straight line okay that's what happened right so if you go deep enough you can find a straight line so you get a t average style uh, sorry it's a t a okay t a right so uh equation 5.5.48 okay this equation 5.48 is a sine wave amplitude decreases with that so as you go deeper the the, the amplitude decreases okay with that so the d in equation 5.49 is a damping that that depends on d depends on uh this uh what you call that uh uh, diffusivity, the thermal the apparent thermal conductivity, diffusi diffusivity, and the angular, we call it the angular frequency. Okay, angular frequency. All right. So, uh, it, uh, if you go five point one six here, five point one six reveal the amplitude. Uh, a multiplied by exponential z over d. Okay. Uh, a multiplied by exponential z over d. That's the amplitude. All depths have the same period. Okay, same period. So it's tau equals two pi over. Uh, angular frequency so all depths have the same annual average temperature so we can see if you if you take the at, the at the surface you take all the temperature every point in this uh, sine sinusoid graph for zero depth 
take all you average it out you still get uh, this uh, 10 degree Celsius if you take at the depth of uh, negative 100 take every point you add it up and you uh, you take average uh, you divide it by the average point you still get uh, 10 degree Celsius uh, so that, that's what you mean if you do, do for 200 uh, centimeter depth also it's the same you will still get the same annual average temperature da all right okay so let us look at example 5.5 .5. uh, let's say you have a two max two maximum and minimum thermometer uh, buried in the soil for one year and then excavated okay so the recorded temperature degree sources are given in table 5.7 all right calculate the apparent thermal diffusivity and the damping depth for this soil all right so um, look at table 5.7 we have data for example 5.5 you see at the depth uh, negative 100 centimeter negative 200 centimeter means it's 100 centimeter, centimeter below the surface of the soil 200 centimeter below the surface of the soil so they recorded the temperature over the time so they know that the t max for depths of uh, 100 centimeter is 25 degrees Celsius t max uh, uh, t mean is 7 degrees Celsius so they take the difference they have around 18 degrees Celsius for two negative uh, for 200 centimeter below the soil surface the t max is 21.5 the t mean is 10.5 right so um, they have around um, around uh, the difference is t max or minus t mean uh, 11 degrees of this all right so from these uh, we can extract from uh, the previous equation so this equation so uh, t max is when uh, t a okay uh, t a t a plus the maximum point and uh, uh, t, t mean is when the ta minus the minimum point so when it is post it is maximum so t must be plus the amplitude so sine uh, should be positive one so when t is mean is minimum so t must be minus a uh, minus a exponential z over d so the amplitude so minus the amplitude so because sine is uh, become negative one okay Right. so that's why we have uh, t max equals to t a t average temperature plus the amplitude and t mean is the t average minus the amplitude so we take the t max minus t mean t max minus t, t mean for this case we will get changes of temperature equals to 2 m 2 a multiplied with the exponential z over d All right so and then we have uh, two different depths so in this case uh, when we take the ratio okay take the ratio of uh, that one over that two right so we have something like this and then we can actually calculate for the the damping depth okay it's 203 centimeter all right and then we can also calculate the amplitude uh, which is not necessary in this case but we can calculate it and then we can use the damping equation that relates to the the diffuse uh, the thermal the apparent thermal conductivity diffusivity and we can try to to get the, the relation for the apparent thermal conductivity, thermal conductivity diffusivity in this case we get this equation and then we we'll try to find the d we already know is 203 centimeter the tau is the uh, the tau is uh, what call that uh, the tau is at, uh, wait, wait. the tau is period okay so the tau period here is uh, is uh, one year so 365 days so we put in the the value for, for the damping depth and also the, the, the period 365 days uh, we can calculate the the apparent thermal diffusivity so 355 centimeter square per day okay so uh, let's look at the soil temperature observation okay so we have a figure 5.17 diagonal variations in temperature measure at different depths in uh, a loam soil okay so uh, Okay, diagonal variations diagonal variation in soil affected by types of surface cover and uh, incoming radiation so it means uh, diagonal variations uh, you, you have a different uh, radiation will also affect the diagonal variation okay so if you cover with plastic also we will affect the diagonal variations of the or, or of the soil all right so figure 5.17 shows the diagonal soil temperature at four depths okay at zero at uh, surface at five centimeter below the surface 10 cm below the surface and 20 cm below the surface uh, so temperature at 4 depths in the loam during summer okay before sunrise 
minimum temperature at the surface. So you say before sunrise, uh, minimum temperature at the surface uh, that increases with that. So as we go deeper into the soil, uh, uh, we can see that the temperature is higher. So 5 cm is higher than the surface and uh, 10 cm is higher than 5 cm and uh, 20 cm is higher than 10 cm. So the temperature is higher as we go deeper. So that one is before the sunrise, right? So thus heat is leaving the soil. So the heat is moving from within the soil uh, to the surface, right? Time lag associated with soil heat, soil heat flow, uh, the lower depth, okay, lower depth continue to cool for a period of time, okay. Um, so there's some some kind of time lag here, right? Okay, you can see here. Uh, so the the uh, the surface soil will heat up faster, then followed by five centimeter. 10 cm and 20 cm. Okay, so that is a, some kind of time lag appear. So, lower amplitude of the diurnal wave at a lower depth, which consistent with the damping depth concept. So, you can see that the amplitude is greater at the surface, but if you go deeper and deeper, the amplitude is smaller and smaller. So, this is called the, uh, what call the lower amplitude of the diurnal wave at lower depth. Okay, so this is uh, consistent with the, with, with the damping depth concept. Okay. Damping that is basically means uh, the what uh, the uh, the concept here um, the D here so the damping that okay so damping that uh, state that if we go deeper the diurnal variations amplitude is becoming smaller and smaller as we go deeper into the soil all right so this is um, uh, this is basically uh, what it means here okay. So now let us look at example 5.7. Okay, so let us read the question. Although the sine wave model of soil surface temperature does not uh, quantitatively describe the shape of the daily um, uh, soil surface temperature in most cases, the diurnal damping depth uh, is still useful in, uh, uh, in uh, analyzing the penetration of wave with a daily frequency, assuming that the the thermal diffusivity of a uh, loam soil of Yaku, Yakuwa has a constant value of about 4.5 multiplied with 10 to the power 93 centimeter square per second. So it is uh, uh, okay. So analyze and interpret the data in a Figure 5.17. Okay, using the damping depth concept. So um, so we are given this uh, uh, this uh, thermal diffusivity, apparent thermal diffusivity of this value. All right. And then we know the equation for the damping depth and we, uh, we want to do it for uh, in this case we want to do it for daily frequency so it's one day so we can calculate the damping depth of 11 centimeter all right so if you look at the soil here uh, the temperature variation in the different depths of the soil in a figure 5.17 uh, at uh, 20 centimeter depth see the temperature varies around 25 degrees Celsius so the t average is around 25 degrees Celsius so the surf, we want to find the uh, surface amplitude AS. S is the basically, basically the surface. So the amplitude for the surface AS, we take the T max. Um, so the surface is zero centimeter. So we take the T max is around forty five degrees Celsius, uh, but, uh, minus the T average, which is twenty five degrees Celsius. We get about twenty degrees Celsius for the amplitude at the surface. So now we try to try to make some estimation for five centimeter. So at five centimeter depth, so a at five centimeter, uh, so the a s at the surface is uh, twenty degrees Celsius. The exponential, uh, we want to find the depth at negative five centimeter uh, divided by the damping, which we calculate is eleven centimeter. We get about twelve point seven degrees Celsius. Okay, so we already know the t average. Now we know that we already calculated the amplitude at uh, five degrees five five centimeter. So we take the average, which is twenty five degrees Celsius, plus twelve point seven, which get us about thirty seven point seven degrees Celsius. So we look at five centimeter depth, the temperature variation, from about twenty, to the highest, about thirty seven, thirty eight degrees Celsius. So the estimation, uh, here is quite the max here is quite correct. So we get thirty seven point seven degrees Celsius. If we look at, we do the same for ten degrees, ten centimeter depth. We get about thirty-three point one degrees Celsius. 
So 33.1, let us look at 10 cm. 33.1 maximum, yes, it's almost, uh, almost uh, similar to the estimation. And if you look at 20 cm, we get about 20, D max is 28.3 using the same method. So if you look at the variation, yes, it's also very close to 28 degrees Celsius. Right. So these methods of est estimation for daily, uh, for daily frequency using the damping depth is uh, quite uh, useful in this sense. Okay. All right. So let's let's talk about diurnal variation again. So uh, if you look at this uh, figure five point one eight, it's a monthly variations of soil temperature in relation to depths. Okay. So summer uh, from May to August, soil temperature is warmer than air temperature, except at uh, two hundred forty centimeter depth. Okay. So top in the summer time, top layer warmer. So heat move downward. So heat move from uh, surface of the soil uh, towards the depths of the soil. So heat move down. In winter time, deeper layer warmer than surface. So deeper deeper layer is uh, warmer, and the surface is cooler because of winter. So heat move from within the soil to the surface of the soil. All right. So and you also look at the maximum temperature at uh, 15, 60. 120 and 240 centimeter uh, that uh, occurs at uh, uh, 1st July, 15 July, 1st August and 1 September respectively. So you can see that there's a shift in the maximum temperature as we go deeper into the uh, soil. So that basically means that's a kind of a time lag of a maximum temperature happening within the soil. Okay, so this slide uh, uh, show to you that you can use heat to determine soil physical property. So remember that uh, we have this uh, uh, soil heat capacity. Uh, this is a uh, uh, volumetric uh, soil heat capacity. All right. So we have uh, for air, for water, and uh, solid. Of course, solid can accumulate for uh, mineral as well as organic material. So um, uh, we, we, you know, for the simplification to 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 obtain certain parameter of the soil. Uh, we can first try to assume that the, the volumetric heat capacity of the, of the air it can be negligible, so equal to zero. So we can simplify it to only mineral, organic, and water. And then uh, you can combine the mineral, mineral and organic into a uh, solid material. So you assume that it's a soil solid material. So you only have uh, 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 volumetric solid uh, heat, uh, heat, uh, heat content. Okay volumetric uh, heat capacity of solid material and then you only like with solid material and water all right and you can make further uh, assumption um, you can break it up uh, this uh, volumetric heat capacity to specific heat capacity by including the density of solid and the density of water okay so you get this kind of form and then uh, you can combine the the uh, uh, the uh, volumetric solid content uh, with the uh, particle dense, but, uh, particle dense, sorry, the density of solid material combined, you get the bulk density, right? So the bulk density, so we have a bulk density here. So imagine that if you if you know the the volumetric heat capacity of the soil, okay, volumetric heat capacity of the soil, uh, and then uh, you know uh, this uh, density of water, uh, specific heat capacity of uh, of uh, of uh, of a uh, of water and then the volumetric uh, uh, water, water content of water and then you know the, the specific heat capacity of solid material you can predict the bulk density okay so that's, that's uh, basically that's how uh, useful uh, it is uh, when you know how to simplify the physical parameter uh, to, to obtain certain parameter that you want to determine 